Hey everyone, just a reminder that this is a mental health podcast, so some content discussed may be triggering for some. If you're not feeling up to it, hit pause, come back another day, we're not going anywhere. If it is an emergency, please don't hesitate to contact Lifeline on 13 11 14. That is a 24-hour service. Thank you. Turn up the talk podcast. Tackling mental health together. G'day guys and welcome to another episode of Turn Up The Talk. You're joined by Pat Clifton, Lucky Drew Morris, brought to you by the Covelli Hotel and Doyle's on the beach down at Watson's Bay. Today we're joined by a pretty special guest. He's played over 200 games for Melbourne Victory, over 90 goals, 54 appearances for the Socceroos and 28 goals for the Socceroos. Quite a rap sheet, mate. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a good rap sheet, man. It's better than having the other rap sheet, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for taking the time to come on, brother. How you been? My pleasure. Yeah, pretty good, man. Um, look, it's obviously tough down here in Victoria because of, uh, you know, restrictions and only allowed out a certain amount of time. And I could possibly see, um, you know, from those that go to jail, how prison, how sometimes they can feel a little bit isolated and feel like, uh, you know, the world's against them, which I suppose it is in that situation. But it feels like it very much here. And yeah, it's really intense sometimes even just walking down the street because you're like I was just telling you, you don't know if you're in someone's personal space. They probably don't know if you're in yours. But, you know, I'm, I'm pretty cruisy. If I, if I get this so-called COVID, it is, well, I get it. <laughs> I just have to isolate for two weeks. But, yeah. Being a professional athlete for, what, 20 years, how hard has this been? I mean, it's one hour a day of exercise. Are you strict with that hour a day? You need to get out? Well, yeah, to be honest, I, I do. Like, um, it's hard to kind of switch off from being a pro for so long just to kind of... Um, being that, uh, like, uh, I suppose, no no exercise and sort of let yourself go. I mean, uh, I need it for just um, just to clear my mind. It's more from from a mental perspective than anything else. Like, uh, but I, I try to get out. I go, went for a run, run today. Um, if people from the, the suburb of Yarraville watch this, clean your shit up if you don't. <laughs> some, some shit. Clean it up because I, I just stepped in a big one today, and I, I always seem to when I'm walking, my girlfriend has to kind of watch. Say, hey, watch out! There's like you know because there's you know, shit on the <laughs> on the footpath. So keep it clean. Come on, people, keep it clean. <laughs> <laughs> you spoke about the isolation and how you get out to clear your mental health. Mm. How has that been? Like you said, you all of a sudden you're used to being out and about. You can leave when you like, and all of a sudden you're restricted one hour a day. We know you've had your own personal experiences with mental health. How are you yeah. coping? Um, look, it's it's not easy. Um, for me, like I said, I, I need to get out and kind of do the things that I like, uh, whether it be mountain biking and um, up in the hills in, in, in like just out of Melbourne or or running or, or exercise or tennis, golf. And that for me is like, um, I suppose, clearing my, my, my thoughts about certain things and, and helping me kind of, you know, focus. But I, I think in this time, um, found it really tough actually I, it's funny enough I, I'm speaking to you guys now I actually just reached out to go and see a um, uh, a psychologist uh, because uh, I just felt like things and people don't talk about it um, you know and I feel like things are closing in you, you, you feel like the world's against you your perspectives on things aren't what they are and then you start blaming people for things that obviously there's a, there's a deeper issue there. And uh, I think with these times, it's like, okay, it's good because you actually get the opportunity to, to not work on surface stuff, but deep stuff that's kind of been maybe plaguing you throughout your life. And um, but it's now it's, I suppose it's the time to reach out and have that opportunity to reach out. I'm just really grateful that the government has decided to go, okay, we're gonna start, I know that the 10 um, visit plan for mental health, we, they subsidize that. Now it's 20, but for me, it should be free anyway. It's like, uh, for me, that's the most important um, thing that any person is their mental health and, and the way that they, they live their life. And, and, and if people are struggling, how can we help that? I mean, the government seems to be subsidising, I, I, I don't know, but stuff that's not as, maybe as important as what mental health is. And, you know, just a quick story um, on this, how tough this period's been is that my brother... Um, in South Australia, going through a bit of a rough spell with his uh, with his ex girlfriend, um, and then he's uh, you know 
because he felt like he couldn't reach out. He's he's kind of rang me and said, "Look, Arch, I'm I'm sorry, and uh, I'm just going to have to um, uh, say bye." And I'm like, well, "You know what the hell?" So I've actually had to 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 ring and get someone to go over there and check on his health, his safety, and you know, and he's gone and harmed harmed himself. And uh, you know, if, if I hadn't have maybe rang, I, I don't know what would have happened in that like in that time that uh, you know no one was there. Uh, but now he's um, obviously that, and, and that's kind of his story too. And he's reaching out. Um, obviously, he's taken a, a little bit further than what he has in the past. But these are the issues that a lot of people are plagued with at the moment: is um, just feeling like the world's closing and I'm in on them, and they haven't got someone to speak to, or like, or they feel like they can't speak to anyone. Uh, I'm just super thankful that I, I felt like there was something not right, and he's on the mend, and, and it's great. But these are stories that are happening. Uh, in the community that we don't we don't know about because uh, I think the focus is on so many other things and mental health is the most important. And I just read the the, the amount of suicides in our communities, it, you know, jump ridiculously. And just because of the situation, probably maybe not people having that opportunity to reach out or feel like they can't reach out. So kudos to you boys for obviously having a podcast that helps um, get messages, awareness out there that, uh, you know, no one's, um, alone and that we're all connected and we all can you know hopefully pull whatever person's in some you know depression or deep thoughts that we can help thank you and we're sorry to hear about your brother but it's good to hear oh mate he's, but, but look he, mate that's his journey and uh um you know it was he, he's uh he's in a better place now um he's got people around him he needs to um and that's just it's just a, a story in so many that's happening at the moment but uh it's just, again, it's just being able to reach out and even to a friend or family just to say, look, you know, I'm going through a bit of a tough spell. Can, can you help me out? And sometimes just a, a call or a text or a message uh, certainly goes a long way. And I'm, now he's, I'm really, really grateful he's, he's turned his life around just in this little period. But, I mean, it's, it's still going to be a really long journey. Yeah, of course. If we can go back to where we were just talking about the government and subsidising things, mm. I think it has come, come on more. They're a lot more aware of the government. Growing up, yeah. you... Was mental health a taboo topic? Sorry? Was mental health That's, a taboo topic growing up? N- no, not at all. Like, I feel like it's only sort of come to the forefront in the last decade or so. Um, uh, my first sort of knowledge of um, uh, mental health organisations was the Big Blue. So the Big Blue was like a foundation, obviously, that, that helped with um, men, men's health. Uh, and so naive I was, is that like, you know, when we played Sydney FC and uh, Melbourne Victory, that was called the Big, Big Blue. Blue. <laughs> yeah. So uh, when, we, when we had the psychologist come into our uh, meeting one day and said, "Actually, what do you feel about the Big Blue?" Um, which was which is Beyond Blue. Sorry, so Beyond Blue, uh, which is the organisation. I said uh, they go around asking everyone, and I, they come to me. What do you think about the, the Big Blue and Beyond Blue? And I'm like. I don't feel any pressure. It's just a game. I love those sort of games. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I remember my mate next to me just laughing to himself because it's like, man, we're not even talking about the actual football match. We're actually talking about the the, the organisation, Big Blue, or what um, you know, mental health. But that was probably uh, you know my first uh, thoughts on mental health. But I tell you what, I wish it had been around uh, a lot longer than what it has now. And it needs to start in schools. It needs to start. Um, Everything needs to start in schools, and I just feel like we're we're, we're bogging kids down with um, putting pressure on them to succeed at things that they don't even necessarily need or passionate about. And I just feel like we should be teaching these kids at a young age the importance of like uh, mental health, uh, what's your passion, what makes you happy, all those sort of things that uh, seem to get lost uh, at the moment. We've got to start somewhere. I'm just glad it's out there now. We've got Movember. Um, but it certainly helps beyond blue. And there's so many organisations. The more we keep putting it, the message out there, the more the people that feel like they, they haven't got anyone, they're aware of it and they get help. Yeah, exactly right. Mm. But growing up, obviously, you weren't too aware of mental health. Can Looking mm. back now, now you know what mental health is, can you look back and say mental health is something you grew up with? Sorry, mental illness is something you grew up with? Um, look, I feel like we've all got some kind of issue, um, issues no one's perfect and I feel like um, with my obviously uh, growing up in, in the professional environment some of those things 
they get pushed aside because there's so much pressure on you wanting to perform and and um, having success and you, you forget all those little things and I, I feel like if I had been exposed to, to some of those um, organizations early on I would have been able to deal with situations instead of masking them whether it be drinking or whether it be doing anything that like wouldn't help you know it's um, there's uh, and just to have that awareness and, and someone telling me that, you know there's a better way to do things uh, I feel is important and, I, and you know in certain situations throughout my career uh, I felt like I could have de um, certainly helped in situations that I felt that there was, I was you know um, really struggling with the breakup of my family and, and, and my marriage the ending of my career um, like just so little so some of those things just came all at once and I was like man I, sometimes I couldn't even get out of bed and even when football was a, a, a place for me to, to kind of go and forget about a lot of things that wasn't even helping me so it wasn't until I sort of reached out to my um, other brother who works in the mental health sector to say look you know I'm struggling these things are really um, coming like just struggling and uh, you know and, just with, with that and being able to um, share it with people uh, and sharing it with you guys and, and not being ashamed of all that and, and being honest, I think uh, is an important thing. And like I said, like people mask their their, their thing in in ways they probably shouldn't. And um, you know, I've been I've done that and I probably still do it now. It's all, we're all learning. Probably I'll probably be about 80 years old and still learning. You know, the fundamentals of life, but. You know, it's it's just good that we're we're starting on the right track. Yeah, mate, your um your Movember video, which you mentioned before, was um it was just so powerful and Thanks. so special. And I think, like you said, it is important as people in your position with high profiles that they reach out and they mm -hmm. start talking about how they're feeling because hopefully that can lead other people to do the same. And mm -hmm. one of the things or two things for me that jumped out in that interview was the first one. You spoke about how you drove over the Westgate Bridge every day. Yeah. And those yeah. thoughts. If you could tell us about them and then how your relationship with your dad has sort of blossomed as well. Well, I, I think um, that was a period when uh, breakup of the, the marriage, um, my, my kids um, being taken, well, not taken, but they, they moved out of the state. So I couldn't really be with them because of obviously football. Um, and then also getting told that I wasn't going to be a Melbourne Victory player next year, the next season. And, and like all of a sudden the walls were just like, wow, what do I need to do? I, I can't, you know, you just feel like there's no way out. And, you know, sometimes you, you cross the, everyone has thoughts of, um, I feel about, you know, the easy way out. And I suppose me for, for, was look, you know, the things that I was doing, um, it felt like the easiest way was just go over the West Coast and, and jump. Like, you know, it was, it was that simple. I mean, and, and even to this, like, especially in this ISO period, why I've got to go probably reach out to a psychologist and I'm going to see one is because those little thoughts creep back in about, you know, life would be so much easier um, if, you know, what if I just end this? Things will be a lot happier. Things will smooth on, be smooth, and 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 that was my feeling. And um, I'm just I'm happy that I've got the right people around me to be able to kind of, um, for instance, my girlfriend who sees different changes and shifts, and that's where you got to notice in people, and that's by reaching out. You know, it's like you, you see little shifts in people that, and and the way that they behave is not how they normally are. And uh, so I think that was uh, obviously a real dark period and, and I, again i was just it's just about reaching out and then obviously it, it once you feel like you're um you know moving on or learn a lot about yourself and uh on the right path to kind of turning your life around and, and being happy uh, you know you build other relationships or, or the ones that you've kind of forgotten and that sort of helped me build the relationship with my dad he was you know he's he, he <laughs> you know parents are perfect I mean, I have kids. I, I, it's only probably in this last period that I, because I haven't been able to see them, and that adds to that that whole mental health side of things. But uh, you kind of reflect, and, and if you were present in as a dad or not, and I, I felt like a long period of my um, 
being a parent, I, I wasn't. And, you know, but then I realized it's, it's hard. It's, it's bloody hard work. You know, I don't know if you boys have kids, but it's hard work. And I, now I have respect for my dad. Okay. He was probably, his environment was tough growing up too, because he, he, he came from a poor family, but it's just funny how all these sort of things that happen to you, you, you start reconnecting with people and, and building relationships that were lost. Also with, in another interview, I read, you said, I'd go to training and it was a release for me. I'd get on the pitch and I'd let it all out. Yeah. In your final year of soccer, you felt like you couldn't even do that anymore. Mm. What did you turn to? Um, look, obviously, for me, it was, was drinking and, and carrying on. And, and, you know, and that, for me, was the easiest way to escape things. And, and it got to the point where I was even, like, ringing up. And it took, when I was going, when I had training, it was like, you know, I'm not feeling well. It's because... You know, the night before, or even that morning, I was was drinking, and um, and that was that was hard because uh, you know, I love football. <laughs> I was feeding my blood. I was four years old when I first kicked the ball, so and it had always been a release for me. But then, obviously, when it wasn't working, um, it became it became harder. And uh, you, like I say, you feel really isolated. You don't want to leave your your, your place. You're feeling like you're letting down. Um, you know, letting down people, you don't really think about yourself, you just think about others and, and, and I feel like that's what happens is that you, you, you do you forget about yourself. Um and then you're not kind to yourself and that's kind of that period that I was in and um but again I'm I'm pretty grateful and thankful that I had the right people around me to, to put me in the right direction, have had the right people to talk to. Um and again it's just building awareness. For someone that's sort of not to the extent that you were going through, obviously, as a professional athlete, but someone mm. in the hole that you were in, what's a, what's a tip to, to help them get out of that? Is it just to have a conversation? Yeah, 100%. A conversation. Um, and I, I feel like now it's... Um, even when I speak to mates of mine and, like, you think that they're the hardest, <laughs> toughest blokes when you see them in person, but, like, uh, I feel like with all these this talk and... and and the mental health and people are opening up more and it's a lot easier to be able to tell someone what you're actually going through, what you're feeling, and then they can relate. It's so, and then, then the conversation starts. And um, I, I think that's the important thing is to, to reach out to someone to um, not be afraid to, to say how you're feeling. It's, uh, you know, it's what I've learned over the last few years is that, like I said, a man, everyone's got this perception of what a man should be. But uh, the actual fact is that we're all human. We all we all feel, we all, we've all got emotion, we all love, we all hurt, we all hate, we all love. It's just, it's just uh, life. And uh, I feel like if we break down those walls and barriers of, of that, um, what, what a man should be and, and, and have a conversation, um, you know, it's just better. Awesome. That's great. Mm. <laughs> what is... Um... What does life after football look like for you? So we saw you involved in some academies. Is yeah, that, is yeah, right? yeah. So look, man, football's in my blood. I, I, I love it, and um, but I, I love it at a at a level where I, I see kids getting enjoyment from it. I mean, I, I still love to see a kid that's talented, and uh, and then you can try to guide them in the in the way that you want. And obviously, with being part of football star academy, that they focus on just schools. Um, so like going there, kids have fun and, and that's the important thing about it. I mean, for me, I've always played with a smile so I, I want to, you know, give that to the kids, the opportunity to ha have a kick and obviously do school doing stuff with Fox Sport. I've actually become a, um, uh, a ambassador for Polish Man so I don't know if you've heard of Polish Man but, it's, um, you know, stopping violence against children and kids across the world. I mean, I think the frightening stat was like a billion kids um, are subjected to some kind of domestic violence or, or, or uh, you know, sexual abuse across the world. So, I mean, um, I feel like this period kind of opens your eyes to so many things that are, that are going on and that are, are more important than, um, you know, trying to make a buck here or there. So, uh, yeah, that's that's something I'm really passionate about. And um, no, hopefully I can still do a lot more with Fox and football, uh, grassroots level at the top, being part, a part of something. But, Man, I've just enjoyed your journey. I'll, I'll take one day at a time and see what happens, man. Who knows what I'll be doing? It's a good attitude. Congratulations <laughs> on that. We yeah, cheers, bro. We a post last night about fan questions. 
Okay. Quite a few, but we've just narrowed them down. So we got one. Okay, sweet. And one was, what's your favourite? What was your favourite place to play at? Oh, favourite place. Um, so you say I, I used to love playing at Sydney, you know, especially Sydney FC, uh, because uh, <laughs> the shit they used to give me. Um, we were in the COVID yeah. times. Yeah, so oh, we, didn't, no. we didn't give you anything. Oh, uh, we, yeah. we were on the side. <laughs> well, you know, no, you got to hang up on us. Mate, that contributes to my mental state. <laughs> You're the reason why I'm a whack job. <laughs> no, look, I mean, but for me, it was like, you know, when whenever I hear the chant that Australia says no, Australia says no, Archie Thompson, Australia says no, like for obviously representing um, the Socceroos. But for me, it was more that it was a sign of respect. And, and I love playing against Sydney because it was always such a great atmosphere and stuff. But um, even still cop stick, when I'm with uh, when I was at the games in the grounds, like uh, I was at a, oh, I can't even remember. It was my Sydney victory game, and uh, man, I was coughing some abuse. Like it's, it's it doesn't stop. Like it's uh, even when there's a Melbourne City uh, victory derby, I, I, like I'm a mutual now, man. I, I only just played the game. You, you know that's past. But still, coughed them some real real abuse from the uh, City fans. But you know. That's, it's a, in a way, I like to see it as kind of still a bit of respect, but um, yeah, <laughs> a bit of fun too. No, definitely. I think um, just along that as well, when Steve Smith, he speaks about the Ashes last year and every time mm. he walked out to bat, the, the Poms, the English crowd just absolutely gave it to him. And in that yeah. documentary, he spoke about how all he looked at it was a sign of respect because he goes that they wanted me out. So that's, yeah. all, that's all I looked at. I didn't take it personally. I was like, okay, well, I'm pretty good then if they just want me out. Well, yeah, well, that uh, that's what I kind of, feel like um, a lot of the, what a lot of clubs and a lot of fans used to do because of that. But then, you know, there's some places I go and like, ah, oh, man, I hated you, but I loved you. Or like, you know, yeah. you, you, were, you were that type of player that, um, man, you used to kill us, but respect because I really enjoyed the way that you played. So um, that, that's cool. I mean, I feel like it's, uh, if you're going to have an impact on someone's got a life, that's why I feel like, oh, I mean, for me, it's uh, about being humble and trying not to let the ego get away from you, which I have a lot of the time in my career and life, but I feel like I've got to getting a hold of it. But um, it's just about having that um, legacy of people seeing how you, you play and you're humble and, and that they, you love the game and they, they see you, you love the game and, and you, you can stop and, and have that conversation with them after it instead of kind of giving them the cold shoulder, which uh, I feel like I've, I've done over my whole career and that's why I have such a good relationship with a lot of supporters anywhere, but especially with my own here at Milne Victory. Um, so well, a question from us, actually. We brushed one of the fan questions, so we can go <laughs> our um, sport questions. In there. We were doing um, a little bit of videos, or watching a few videos this morning from the 2006 World Cup. Yeah, yeah. What was that like to be a part of? Obviously, that was like a pretty special Australian team, and everyone knows sort of what happened in the quarterfinal. What was that journey like, that World Cup? Yeah, man. Um, it was awesome. Like, to be honest, though, it's hard to say because we were kind of shipped in this little compound that we, we didn't see much of what was going on. And, you know, it was shitty internet back then. Man. So it was like, <laughs> there was nothing like what we have now. So we couldn't get what was happening back home. But I, I suppose from a, a team and, and, and a brother ship and, and I don't know, a family, for me, that was a special, special time because we, we, we were like that. I mean, there was no egos. It was just, bunch of boys that are um, broke such a, a long history of, of not making the World Cup and we're there and we're just every, enjoying every, every moment of it. Um, I feel like probably I've been part of a lot of qualifications after that and, and obviously going um, qualifying for World Cup just didn't have that same kind of, I don't know, that, that family feel about it. That uh, you know that we're, uh, but for me, like representing Australia and, and getting into those squads were amazing because um, it, it's you know it's a pinnacle for me. But that that team and that era and that that World Cup was special, man. And you know just celebrating after that game against Croatia, man, I was like there was forty thousand there, twenty thousand stay behind, which were like you know Aussie fans going absolute nuts, me on the sideline air guitaring to ACDC. <laughs> um, and then even after Mark Saduka, like, you know, he said, man, Archie, that was unbelievable. You know, because I was just up and down with the corner flag. Um, <laughs> I, even had, 
and, and the crowd was just going off. So, I mean, I didn't get a minute <laughs> of the World Cup, but I probably was more the, the most entertaining to, to watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was good fun. We've got one more question. You might may have just touched on it. What's your proudest moment on and off the field? Oh, proudest moment. Obviously, having my kids were, for me, the proudest moment. Um, yeah. On the field, there's been so many good ones, man. Like, obviously, the five goals in the grand final against Adelaide was pretty special. Um, uh, World Cup qualifiers. Probably one of the special moments was... Um, Playing in a Uruguayan game uh, in 2005 in Montevideo, like starting that match was crazy. Like listening, I was um, with the anthem and Australian anthem come on, uh, couldn't hear it. But then when they obviously played theirs, that you could feel the ground shaking underneath, and it was just like an atmosphere that was was unbelievable. So for me, that was probably a highlight. But then I feel like a highlight. I scored a couple of goals with the Socceroos. Obviously, thirteen and one was <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> but but um, one goal I scored against Iraq. Uh, we were down one nil. Our qualifications weren't great. We were, we were really um, struggling to to qualify. And Timmy scored a goal like he does. And then I ended up coming on and uh, scoring a winner. And that actually helped us sort of gain a bit of momentum. Got our um, World Cup back on track because that's what we needed. So that was a really important match for me too. But there's right. lots, man. There's lots. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. And I think you summed it up before. You um you always sort of played with a smile on your face. And to have someone like you with your character and your profile come out and talk about being vulnerable is absolutely great. And I'm sure it's going to help a lot of people. For those people out there struggling, what are three tips that you'd narrow it down to? Ah, oh, three tips. Um, mate, look, it's it's hard. I mean, I'm still learning. <laughs> like, you know, every every day is different. Every every time, every day you're feeling something different. So, I mean, for me, it's, it's obviously um, have a conversation, reach out to someone. Um, you know, don't don't be afraid to to tell people how you feel and what you're feeling. Um, I, I don't. I think people appreciate that because. Um, if you keep a bottle in, it's just going to start eating you inside and out. And I feel like if you, if you have the conversation and, and you're honest, then people relate to you and then, then they can tell you how they're feeling and then they tell you how they've got through that. And, and then that's like, that's how you kind of um, navigate through something because we're all, we're all the same, man. We're all, we're, no one's better than uh, the other person. Um, we're all just trying to live the best life we can. So obviously don't be afraid to tell you how you feel. How you feeling? Have the conversation. The third one, man, um, probably just, I don't know, man, it's hard. I think just, just be grateful that you get, you know, you know, you're on this planet, you're living your life and um, just to be happy and uh, and just do the best that you can. Just do the best that you can. That's all, all you can do cool. in life, I think. Well, like, like you said, I don't know. If I, for a tips, I don't know, man. Like I said, I'm, it's, it's, there's so many things you can you can do and say. It's just, uh, but I think the first one is just just to be not afraid to open up and say how you're feeling. A hundred percent. Well, like like you mm. said, mate, for, for someone of your caliber to come out and and speak so openly and take the time to join us, we really appreciate. Ah, it. my pleasure. My we, pleasure. We love the work you're doing and and congratulations with the work you're doing and all the best, mate. Ah, uh, cheers, Tim. Thanks, lads. I appreciate it. And once again, thanks to the Clavelli Hotel and Doors on the Beach down at Watson's Bay. And thanks to you guys for tuning in. And we'll see you next time.